Welcome back, Ronin Renegades. I am Lupine Fiasco. This is Daily Fi Gameplay. Today we're looking at Prism. For anyone who's new to the channel, welcome to the Resistance. What we do here is review replays of games that I played on the Talishar client days or weeks ago, after enough time has passed that I lose my bias and can more objectively judge the quality of my play. I will talk through turn cycles and give my thoughts on the lines I would take now, and compare that to the line I took then at the time of recording. We either learn from my mistakes or reinforce good play patterns with the overall goal of tightening and optimizing our gameplay in the future to take down paper events like pro quests or road to nationals, and most importantly, walk away with that shiny, shiny cardboard. If you would like to check out the list I'm playing here or try it for yourself on Talishar, the Fabry deck link is available in the video description below. While you're down there, if you haven't already done so, please consider subscribing to my channel. A YouTube subscription is the best free way to support me and to make sure that you see Daily Fi gameplay in your video feed five days a week. If you'd like to go above and beyond, then the best paid way to support me is through Patreon, and a Patreon link is also in the video description. A Patreon subscription will get you DFG Discord access. At higher tiers, your name will be featured in every DFG video, You'll get bonus content every week, and there are more great benefits to come. Daily Fi gameplay will always be free five days a week, so for those who can afford to patronize me, I truly appreciate it. Let's talk about our sideboard and some thoughts of mine on the Prism matchup. I'm back to the open format queue, so take our Prism's deck and play here with a grain of salt. Prism players, overall, have had quite the rough road to walk. Their first introduction to the hero came alongside Luminaris, one of the best weapons ever printed in Flesh and Blood. After losing their hero and weapon to Living Legend, LSS eventually gave them a watered-down version in Luminaris Celestial Fury, otherwise known as Tuminaris. Compared to the lines possible with Luminaris, Tuminaris was rather disappointing. A 4-card, 25-value turn cycle that puts a card into Arsenal is incredibly below rate for any hero, and Prism was deemed unplayable by the community at large. Thankfully, after enough persistent online petitioning, LSS granted Prism players with Luminaris, Angel's Glow, otherwise known as Three Minaris. For our purposes, Three Minaris is incredibly difficult to play against. Heralds are great against a class that can't block well, and poppers can be very clunky to play with, as if you don't have the opportunity to block with them, they can mostly just clog up a turn. It's possible that we could catch Prism without spare resources to put into her footsteps to recover from a Phantasm trigger, but overall I'm opting to race Prism until I determine that we just can't win without a little counterplay. I'm trying uh, to get use out of Spring Tune-Up in the matchup just to add a little oomph to my big turns. Uh, the biggest hurdle that Prism presents is her counterplay to Pouncing Lynx lines. By banishing a Herald to Halo of Illumination as a response to us tutoring a finisher, Prism can uh, tutor her Figment of Judgment to turn our Lava Burst or Salt to Wound face down, making it unplayable. As you'll see, the triming uh, is tricky on Talishar. However, to all my Prism players watching, I promise that this line of play works. Both heroes effectively start the game without headpieces, and for my enterprising young Fives out there, I don't recommend trying to use Mask of Momentum instead. Once Prism realizes she doesn't need to conserve Halo for Mopple, she can use it to tutor Figment of Triumph to negate our Art of War or Spreading Flames turns. Prism is shaping up to be a difficult matchup, but let's see if I can navigate it here. We are fortunate to go second in this matchup. Uh, unfortunately, our hand mostly sucks. We will get to block this Herald of Ravages for five, but with a yellow in Prism's pitch, the Herald does have go again, and we don't really get punished for it. Pierce Reality here is something that we would like to break at some point, as it is going to give all of Prism's heralds, or rather the first herald every turn, plus two. 
Unfortunately, this isn't really the hand to do it. Uh, this is a problem I've run into with Phi. I say problem, it's an embarrassment of riches. We are getting a Shuko trigger here. And we can put a Phoenix Flame into our arsenal. So how this turn can look is Spreading Flames, Ember Blade, Phoenix Flame, Lava Burst, pick up an arsenal, second Phoenix Flame, which is a great turn cycle. But it leaves Prism with Pierce Reality as killing an aura with Spectra takes our action point and ends our turn. Go again does not resolve. And I don't wanna do that. I want to be putting the pressure on Prism. I don't want to have a Lava Burst sitting in Arsenal when I could otherwise get my Shugo trigger from it by sending it at Prism's face, especially on a Spreading Flames turn. So we are just going to deal a little damage to Prism, get some cards out of her hand. We are not going to use our Pouncing Links or our Snapdragon Scalers. We are going to pick up an Arsenal on our Phoenix Flame, which means that this Pierce Reality is just going to sit and Prism's turns get better. This Herald of Protection now comes in for 9 instead of 7. Now if it did hit for 7, we still very likely are not blocking it. Um, but we just take 2 extra damage where otherwise we might not have had to. Um, Passing Mirage here is another aura that in theory we need to kill, but because we have no poppers in our deck, it does literal nothing. We don't care whether Prism's Heralds lose Phantasm. Now Prism of course doesn't know that, so there certainly is value to leaving the Passing Mirage. We should not look to clear it just for mind games, um, but as far as Prism's turn cycles, she might be more incentivized to play it rather than pitch it, thinking that we have poppers that could ruin her turn. Uh, here, again, the turn cycle is just kind of leading itself towards sending damage at Prism's face. What we could look to do here is give up our arsenal, which I think is what I want to do. I pick up my Phoenix Flame from Discard, I send it at Prism's face, it gets the Shuko trigger, then we send our non-Shuko Phoenix Flame at Pierce Reality. I would have rather had a Phoenix Flame in Arsenal, but I can't leave Pierce Reality there. And I want to talk briefly about that Mounting Anger play. Had we sequenced differently, had we sent our Phoenix Flame from Arsenal first, the Mounting Anger gets the Shugo trigger and attacks for four, which maybe incentivizes some bad blocking from Prism. But if we do that, now the only way we get value from that Mounting Anger is to pick up and banish our Phoenix Flame from discard. And now we're incentivized to send that at Prism's face for two. So again, we aren't killing the Pierce Reality, and I really don't want that Pierce Reality generating value which is why we are sequencing in such a way that we aren't getting that value from Mounting Anger, and Prism still blocks, but our damage that turn was suboptimal. So now, Herald of Erudition uh, really punishes us for not running Flamescale Furnace, and this is now where I'm realizing, oh, we need Furnace in this matchup, because a two-block Arsenal and three-block Heart from Hand covers up this Erudition, and with Angel's Glow giving the Erudition go again, we really can't let Prism draw two cards. Uh, she has Empyrean Rapture, so the figment that this Herald tutors is going to flip into an Angel. The Angel will have go again if it attacks. Prism can pay for that attack with the cards in her hand, and she gets to follow up with another Herald. So not having Furnace here is just horrendously bad. Um, we could give our Shuko, but I really don't want to give it this early into a game. We could give our Pouncing Links, as it effectively doesn't have an effect. But the problem with doing that is that it now opens the door for Prism to use Halo to find Figment of Triumph. Uh, so this is just catastrophic. We take way more damage here than we needed to had we just had Furnace. Um, and we're really now on the back foot. We are going to get to go 
both wide and tall enough that we are getting cards out of Prism's hand, we're clearing these spectral shields, we're clearing the angel. Um, we are certainly not in a bad position, but we could be in a much better position had we just been able to block that erudition with e strike and furnace. So we're sending uh, our attacks at the person's face. So far, she's given us two cards from hand. She now loses uh, spectral shields. We are also going to get to send E Strike, the Prism's Face, uh, choosing to draw a card here correctly. So we are threatening the other spectral shields as well as potentially a card from Prism's hand. Uh, the Art of War here, going to the Arsenal, is great. We do have our Tunic to pay for it on the next turn, depending on what our hand looks like. So, again, we're not in a bad position, but we could be in a much better position. Um, Herald here for six, we're just going to take that damage. Potentially, Prism is looking to flip an Angel and attack with that Angel. She has the soul to pull it off. Grabbing Figment of Triumph uh, does not have an effect currently, but flipping it into the Angel will have an effect. So basically canceling out our Art of War, but that at least brings us up to a normal turn cycle. We will lead with our Ronin Renegade. I'm essentially here looking to open the door for Blaze Headlong. What I want to have happen is for Prism to block for exact damage, uh, to put a three block in front of Blaze Headlong, which will let me Art of War over the top of that block to snipe this Angel, which is really what I'm looking to do here. I'm not expecting Ronin Renegade to do that because I'm expecting Prism to block it for three, but she blocks it for two, so this is even better. We're going to Tunic here, we're going to play our Art of War, and we are going to banish our Mounting Anger on the off chance that we don't draw a blue. We don't want this one cost in our hand. Um, Prism giving up Empyrean Rapture for its ward effect to cover the Angel. But that's totally fine. Prism only has two cards left in her hand. There's no way she can cover all of this damage. We are getting this Angel this turn. We'll lead with the Ember Blade. Uh, it's worth noting that Triumph's effect only works on attack actions. It doesn't cover weapons. So this Ember Blade does come in for three. It eats the Angel, and now we get to play out the rest of our turn. We're maybe looking to Pouncing Links here, but we're looking to do it at the end of the turn. We want Prism to commit more cards from blocks. If Prism gives up her entire hand, if she blocks with both of these cards, we're definitely using Mop. As it is, she does have a floating resource to pay for Halo, so Mop is still looking pretty bad. Um, Blaze Headlong comes in for four. We are going to get to pick up and play our Phoenix Flame. Still, I think Mopple here is off the table. If Prism is going to take that four, it's pretty likely that she understands what's happening and is going to uh, pay for the Halo. Now, I think what I'm checking for here is her Herald count to see if she maybe doesn't have one in hand. Uh, Halo interaction only works if Prism can banish a Herald specifically to trigger the hero. If Prism doesn't have a uh, Herald in hand, she did, so Mopple there would have been bad. If she doesn't have a Herald in hand, then uh, the interaction doesn't work. Breaking our Snapdragons aggressively there, I think that was probably wrong. Uh, we aren't going to get punished for it with this hand, but... With Prism being at 8, if she doesn't want to block, I think we just say, okay, we save our Snapdragons to finish off, uh, fire off a double finisher turn that we draw into naturally, or fix a bad hand. I don't think we need to get super aggressive there. Um, here we are just playing out this hand. 
Prism is getting low enough on life where eventually she's going to need to start blocking just to not be dead, uh, which is a great position for us to put her in, as she does not have a real weapon. Luminars doesn't have an attack action. So if we attack with this Snatch and Prism blocks it to stay alive, or pitches a card from hand into one of these figments to flip it, then she has a one card to hand, she doesn't get to apply any pressure, and we can still keep looking for lethal in hand. I sped through this part. Um, breaking Mockle here was wrong. Again, uh, if I have one criticism of myself this game, it is that I'm being very liberal with use of my equipment. I should not be this liberal with use of my equipment. I should just be playing out the hands, keeping my mobble for its two block value, keeping my snapdragons to fix something awkward. But I did want to at least show this. So Talishar has a setting in the menu that will uh, prompt you at every interaction window, every priority window, you are going to have the option to do something, even if there's nothing in your hand you can do. It's why when you watch my games, I have this resolution step, for example, that I need to click through even though there's nothing I can do in resolution. So what this prison player and I are talking about is in paper and online, if you set it up properly, there is a priority window between when you uh, break pouncing links and when your turn uh, comes back to you and you get to actually attack with the finisher. That window is when Prism uses Halo of Illumination. You hit with an attack, your mobble says, would you like to use me? You say yes. You go into your deck, you find your Lava Burst. Between where you find your Lava Burst and when you play your Lava Burst, there is a priority window where Prism can use Halo to find Figment of Judgment and flip it face down. Icelander had the same priority window where she would play Blizzard, which was why you had to be very careful about using Mopple against her. But if you don't set up Talishar properly, it won't give you that priority window and you can't use your Halo. You will only be able to use the Halo if your Phi opponent attacks with something that isn't what they banished, because then you will have a priority window in your block step and your reaction step. So as Prism, you will need to go and turn on show all priorities, always get the priority trigger, otherwise you won't be able to do the Halo trick properly. I did want to at least show that so we could to make a point of, hey, prisons, turn that on, because otherwise this is not great testing if you can't do the thing that you use Halo for. Um, but I also wanted to show, from my perspective, using Mopple there was really bad. Um, Prism had the resources available, she would have found a figment, she would have drawn a card to replace the Herald she banished to Halo. Um, I keep looking for ways to get value out of Mopple in this matchup, and they really don't exist. You use it as a deterrent to Prism breaking Halo for Figment of Triumph, and you use it for two block at the end of the game. Otherwise, Mopple doesn't exist in this matchup. Now, if you're opposing, Prism uses their Halo early to break uh, for Triumph. Absolutely, Mopple is 100% back on the table. But while Prism has Halo, Mopple doesn't exist. And while Mopple is on the table, Halo doesn't exist. My biggest takeaway from this game is that we need to be on Flamescale Furnace to block Herald of Erudition. Giving Prism two more cards and potentially a free Angel is catastrophic for surviving the turn cycle and will really put us on the back foot. We saw how much value Prism got from that Erudition, which if it had been blocked, Prison's turn just ends. She has one card in hand and no floating resources. But outside of that, we're trying to play crisp, efficient lines and try to catch Prism without her big heralds to pressure us, which is what we did outside of that erudition turn. I do still feel that running Popperless is correct, but time will tell if that's really the case. I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope you learned something. I hope you enjoyed getting this look at 
three Minaris, as it is very strong, and Heralds are very good against five. If you did, be sure to head jab that like button. My comments are always open for any questions or feedback. Uh, if you've not already done so, I would ask you again to please subscribe to my YouTube channel. It's free. It helps me a lot. But whether you do or you don't, I will see you back here tomorrow for more daily Fi gameplay. And until then, take care.